Have any of you had a family member that doesn't like to ask directions while driving on the road? <laughs> I see hands going up, and I'm not going to look at the person sitting next to him. My dad was just terrible about that. My dad felt if you were going somewhere, you should just go until you got there. And sometimes we would go in the wrong direction. And despite mom saying, or some of us saying, Dad, we don't think this is the right road. In the opening part of God's Stuff Today, we talk about a lady's actual event. Uh, not my family, but a family that was uh, reporting to me just last week that they were on their way to a certain place. And the wife said, honey, this is the wrong road. And you need to turn around and go the other way. And he said, I'm not. He said, this is the way I want to go. And she said, it's fine. You're just not going to get to the place we're supposed to be going. That's the end of the story. <laughs> you ever think about the fact that sometimes we are taking roads that don't get us to the place where we need to be going, to the road less traveled, the road where we ought to or are supposed to be going? It's really interesting. I love the time that we spend with our brothers and sisters at Aldersgate Church. And we had a lovely Wells contingency. Con what's that? Con Yes, thank you. Contingency there at this time. This is a dialogue, so just feel free. And, um, but you know what's really humbling is to be one of the ministers to impose the ashes. And people come to you, male and female, light skin, dark skin, middle skin, hair to be put, moved away, hair to be hoped for. <laughs> you impose the ashes, and when you impose the ashes, you say to them each time, remember your repentance, your baptism, your mortality. And at the end, um, the ministers come to each other and impose the ashes on us. Remember your repentance, your baptism, and your mortality. It's interesting because a lot of us don't stop to think about the fact, some of us further along the way, some of us less far, that we consider life extended and that we've got a lot of time. The truth is that life is limited and our time is too. And so whatever it is that we need to do, that we ought to do, that we want to do, or particularly that we must do, needs to be done. And so we need to think about that. Seneca, a philosopher many, many generations ago, said, do today, because if you don't, it may not be done. And I think it's significant for each one of us to understand that when we talk about repentance and baptism and mortality, we're talking about something positive and good. Every time I've heard a sermon about repentance, it made me feel guilty. The intention of repentance is not to make you feel guilty. It's a turning. Repentance is simply turning. It's turning from one direction and toward another. And if you think about it that way, that means that it's going in the direction that you ought to be going, especially if you want to get to the place that you want to go. And so this particular challenge today, repent and believe, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, says that you and I need to turn from darkness to light. That if we're on a path or on a road that's not helpful, that's not good for somebody we love, or not helpful and not good for us, then we need to think seriously about turning around and going the other way. My friend John Corbett, that just recently retired from years and years at the YMCA, I went to his little retirement party, and we were laughing about things we remembered. And one of the things that he told me was that he had a problem with his truck. I said, oh, he says, a big problem. And I said, what is it? He said, it won't go in reverse. And I said, well, that's a big problem, especially if you want to go in reverse. He said, yeah, if you can't back up, you sometimes can't get out. Isn't that exactly what repentance is? Isn't repentance a kind of a turning or a kind of a finding your reverse gear so that you can move from one place to another? I think the first thing we have to do is repent of self-centeredness. That may not apply to you at all because some of you have no self. You've invested it so much in everybody else. When God said to us, the great commandment is love me, love your neighbor, and love yourself, God meant for you to have a healthy self. Not a selfish, self-centered one, but a self-healthy enough to be able to serve somebody else. And so it's extremely important for us to understand that the center of our sin is wanting what we want and not what God wants. Or if you want to take it a step beyond that, the center of it is wanting what we want and not what other people want. It's not that we always give other people what they want. It's that there are sometimes other people have needs that we know about that need to be addressed, but we don't do it. 
And so we need to turn around from a kind of a putting ourselves in the center and let God be in the center because when that happens, the kingdom is already a little closer. It's an illustration that you all have heard because across the years I repeat stuff. <laughs> I know you don't believe that. But you know why? I, have, I went for a long period of time where I was very apologetic about that, but I've come away from that. I'm going to tell you why. I love that song, He Touched Me, and I've heard it more than once. But every time I hear it, I hear something I didn't hear the time before. And so here's the illustration. Bill McClellan was preaching one time, and he said, let me tell you what repentance really is. Before you repent, your life is a mirror, and you stand in front of it all the time. And your words go like this, I me, my, mine. When you repent, you turn. And in the center of your life is a cross. And the words change. We, our, thee, and thine. And it's true, too. We need to repent from sin as well. Sometimes there is evil that we know. And sometimes it's hurting us or destroying another. Sin is anything that keeps us from a closer walk with God. It's any dividing wall, any circumstance, any continued practice, any behavior that keeps us from becoming the man or the woman that we want to be, that God wants us to be too. And so what we're talking about is turning from a sickness toward a health. I always like it when Jesus says, I've come not to take care, you know, of the well folks. I've come to take care of the sick ones. They're the ones that need the physician. And it's curious because Todd preached a brilliant sermon this morning. It's a wonderful thing to be on staff with two guys that can preach very, very well. Um, and they want to preach more, and I won't let them. But uh, <laughs> let me see if I can explain that to you. It's not that I'm not willing, and it's not that I don't grow every time I listen. It's just that it's my soul. It's my food. It's my drink. You know, and uh, so I just want to as long as I can. Maybe a few more times, I hope. But anyway, he was saying this morning, using the story of the prodigal son, and at the beginning of it, I've read it a thousand times, but it says Jesus was dining with the tax collectors and the sinners, and the religious authorities jumped all over him. See? What you do is you turn from the group that doesn't need you to the group that does. Is there any more significant sign of the kingdom of God than that we should address our love, concern, and compassion toward the people who need it. The ones who don't can make it. But we are among those, and we need to turn from self-centeredness and sin-centeredness to God-centeredness. You've got to be careful, because if you decide to do that, all of a sudden God will make known to you opportunities to do the kingdom's work. It's not bad news, it's good news. The first sermon of Jesus, the Tuesday morning group loves it when I tell them this. The first sermon of Jesus takes less than 15 seconds. Here it is. Repent and believe, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Amen. A lot of people say, I wish more preachers would preach like that. <laughs> I read this last week, this little child, the preacher got to preaching very long. This little child turned to her mama and said, Mommy, if we pay him now, will he quit? Two things. First of all, the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is close. I bet you, I bet you, that you thought the kingdom of God was someplace else, or far away, or maybe somewhere in the future, or maybe not even possible at all. The kingdom of God happens the moment you repent and believe, because in believing and affirming the reality of the living God, the kingdom is there. And then you begin to live as a child of the kingdom, seeing God as sovereign, seeing God as Lord, seeing God in his position as God. And so the kingdom of God is not far away. The kingdom of God is close. The kingdom of God is nearer than hands and feet. The kingdom of God is a very small beginning like a mustard seed on the inside of you. The kingdom of God is becoming sensitive to the world around you and the people that are there. The kingdom of God is daring to reach out in love and forgiveness when you know that love and forgiveness may cost you something. But every time you do it, the kingdom is present. What scripture says is that the kingdom of God is not food and drink, but it's peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Not absence of conflict peace, but presence of purpose and power and motivation in the midst of difficulty peace. 
and the kind of power that helps you. Some of you know this, but some of you don't. Um, our nursery group back there, um, Elaine's been with us for almost 30 years, and her daughter, Marjorie, just recently lost her 36-year-old husband. And uh, that's always a difficult thing, and you always want to try to say something or pray something or do something to be helpful. And the only gift I had to give, I wrote on a little scrap of paper. It was a gift given to me a long time ago when I was diagnosed with my cancer. And it said, we don't know why these things happen. No doctor, no philosopher, no preacher, no teacher can explain why things happen. But there is a greater question. And the greater question is this. How can I bear up to it? How can I overcome? And the writer wrote, you know the answer. The power, the presence the person, Jesus Christ. We have a gift of the kingdom to give to people. And we can give that gift if we would just dare to do it. We have to turn from one place to another. From self and sin to God and the will of God and the way of God as we understand it. It's a piece at a time, a step at a time, not all at once. And then the other thing is to turn to good, just to try to do something good. I had the privilege of being a part of that funeral this last week for John Schimmel. He was a plastic surgeon, surgeon here in town. Family told me an interesting thing about John. I knew him as a child when he was eight years old in Rolling Fork, Mississippi, where I was the minister to youth. You know his first question to me? Will you explain to me more fully about the will of God? Eight years old. That's interesting, huh? But when they asked me to do that, they said, we want it to be kind of religious, but kind of secular. And uh, he was comfortable with some things and not comfortable with others. Yeah, it's a, quite a challenge. And you know what? I was totally inadequate. But I gave it my very best shot. And near the end of it, he liked the philosopher Epicurus, for those of you who study philosophy. Uh, the Epicurean is a person that seeks uh, joy, peace, fun, pleasure, uh, the hedonists are extended in the wrong direction, Epicureans. Anyway, uh, but Epicurus would also say, be sure that you do the good that brings the pleasure, you know, and that kind of stuff. And so there's a book on it, and I read these two things, and I conclude with this. This guy's named Jeremy, and he's talking to his friends. And he said, and as a result of my most recent turning, I have now come to the place where with regard to the cruelty of the world, I have achieved escape velocity. Isn't that neat? And then he turns to his friends, and they're having a party, and he lifts his glass, and he says, I want to tell you just how very delighted I am to be here, to be with you, to be in the room, to be a part of the party. He said, and so... I salute you because of the chance that I've had to be here. Come to think of it, he added, I salute you for the chance that I have had to be. You and I be. We exist. The kingdom is close. Shall we stop going down the wrong road and turn around and go down the right one so that we can be representatives of and participants in the kingdom of God. May God help us make it so. Amen.